and gentlemen, Gene DiNapoli. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli. Happy Monday, December 14th, 2020, the year that just doesn't end. But soon enough, we'll be into a new year with new outlook, positive outlook, and uh, positive things. So glad to have you here tonight. Before we go any further, we want to get this off our chest. Last week, you might have seen the wonderful interview with the great Larry Chance of the group called the Earls. And about five minutes left, I had said to Larry that his band were so great. And one guy in particular uh, was a master of music and an old and dear friend of mine named Bobby Coleman. And unbeknownst to us, Bobby had expired uh, while we were saying this. Uh, we lost a very great musical person and a great friend. So we'd like to dedicate tonight's show to the memory of Bobby Coleman. So we get that right out of the way. Uh, want to talk about our sponsors. Of course, we have people that are behind us. So we want to give them proper credit. We got a new sponsor on board this week. So right now, sundrenchcruises.com, dream destinations travel. Our friends Howard and Karen for the best in honeymoon vacations, cruises, and destinations weddings. You see it's sundrenchcruises.com. For those of you into the CBD oils and CBD gummies, sweetheel.com. Mention Gene, get 20% off your orders and a free gift. Next up, for those of you that need a CPA, somebody that's a little creative, well, Francisco is the creative CPA, transfrancisco.com. Check her out. Pure Organic Dry Cleaners on Tremont Avenue in the Bronx, 3166. Mention our podcast, pay for three items and get one for free. For those of you that cannot get to family and friends, a great way to send Christmas and holiday wishes is by ordering a wonderful gift basket from Anthony's Gift Baskets. Their information is on our page under the Offers tab. And last but not least, a mainstay in my career, a wonderful restaurant out of Yonkers, New York, San Martino Restaurant, where I perform regularly along with a lot of other great acts. They are open for business for old world Italian food, please check out San Martino on Facebook. Um, so, you know, when I started doing this podcast uh, to get myself out of boredom, I reached out to a lot of friends of mine and 98% of them said yes. And then I said, I can't just rely on my friends. So I started to message people that I've been in awe of for years and people who I love their music and I love their songs and never thinking that this man would get back to me or that he would agree to do this. Because like we say time and time again, I'm not Dick Clark. I'm not cousin Brucey. This is not primetime television. We're just a little podcast out of the house, but realistically we reach thousands and thousands of viewers. So we ask everybody, if you like our show, to please share it over and over again. It's on YouTube. You can join our YouTube channel by subscribing to Gene DiNapoli. And uh, our producer behind the scenes is Anthony. So Anthony, would you do me a favor and bring in our guest for the week, the wonderfully talented, boyish, handsome, and one of the few men with the entire head of hair he's had for 60 years. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the original teen idols of the 50s, Mr. Jimmy Clanton. <laughs> Thank Hi. you. Jimmy. Thank you very much. That's you like that introduction? <laughs> That's a heck of an intro. <laughs> you, you know what, Jimmy? You deserve it. You know, uh, forget about the hits, of which there were a good number of hits. Uh, you were realistically one of the first teen idols uh because yeah look at that picture you that's some head of hair that is some head of hair so you uh you started in 56 uh in your hometown of baton rouge louisiana that's correct uh, after i graduated from high school in 1956 okay once i turned 18 
in the state of Louisiana, you can go to a place that serves alcohol. And there were a lot of uh, nightclubs and dance halls. And I hooked up with a band. Uh, they they had changed over from easy listening uh, uh in, in I don't know I know how to put it, just easy listening uh, lounges. Okay. Now all of a sudden the radio was playing uh, top forty and and he this guy just decided you know what I'm missing out on a lot of engagements, but I need a guitar player. <clears throat> I mean I need a killer guitar player. And somebody told him about me because I was probably by by eighteen without a doubt uh, I was the best white guitar player in all of Baton Rouge. Oh yeah, I could I could play, baby. I was could. there an abundance of white guitar players in Baton Rouge? I know I was probably the first one <laughs> come to think of it. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a good one. You got me on that. <clears throat> and this was the band called the Rockets, correct? Yeah. So this fella, uh, he, his band was some, called something else. So he approached me and he made it look very uh, interesting. He said. I've got all these clubs all along the Gulf Coast, all these dance halls. And he said, uh, they're into now the, the sound of the Fast Dominoes and Little Richards and uh, all these different uh, artists. And he said, I want to get into that. And he said, but I know I've got to have a killer guitar player. And you just came to the forefront from everybody I asked. So the bottom line was he hired me as a guitar player. This, this, is, a, this is pretty interesting. So... I, I went ahead and said, okay. So I joined him and we play these different gigs, but he did all the singing. Mm. So he really wasn't a good singer, but he could stay in tune, you know? Right. So we had gigs. And so I was making like, you know, five or six dollars a night. Hey, in 1956, five dollars, you know, w- went a long way. Okay. Right. But all of a sudden, after about <laughs> uh, two months, three months, I had remembered this little band that I sat in for. And I overheard a conversation. This is out of context. I, I heard this guy say to the band leader, well, I have to pay him $5 a night more because he sings. And I went, oh, you know, well, I, I sang at my grandmother's church and I sing around the house. So I thought, hey, you know, so I went to Dick and I told him, I said, Dick, I said, you're going to wear yourself out. You're doing all the singing. You're, you know, you're going to get hoarse. I said, I wouldn't mind doing a song or two here and there. I said, however, the band I was with before you, the guy that did some singing, he got $5 a night more. So Dick kind of hum on. He said, well, we're just going to try you out. Okay. I said, okay. So as everybody knows, in 1957, 58, there was no such thing as a, a, a cassette tape. None of that had been invented. You had to either buy the record or memorize it off the radio. And lo and behold, I'll never forget this. This song came out by one of the Neville brothers on specialty label. I heard it on the radio. I loved it. And I said, this is a perfect song for me to try out. So Dick will give me $5 a night more. So it was a song called Ooh Wee Baby. And I'll never forget. I showed up at the club. I remember this like it just happened. We're talking about 60 some odd years ago. Wow. And so Dick said, okay, we'll give it a shot. So I taught the guys the, the song real fast. And I'm going to sing a little bit of it because this was a, this is really the, 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 the New Orleans, uh, the Louisiana swamp pop sound that I grew up right. with. So I went into the song. Ooh, wee baby. I love, love, love you so. Ooh, wee baby. Don't ever let me go. Fool that I am to think you could love me too. And then the horns. Ooh, we baby. Don't know love will body but you. Well, all of a sudden, everybody in the club started gravi- gravitating up to the front of the stage, uh, including the guys, guys and girls. They all come up. And now they're right down below me. We had a stage up above this, the bar. And they're all staring at me as I'm doing the song. And I read the lips of this guy. I'll never forget it because it changed my career. This guy looked up and I read his lips and he looked over to his buddy. He said, 
man, that kid, that kid can sing. Mm. I went, oh boy, I got something now, you know. So immediately I started getting five dollars a night for, and then eventually, as my popularity is really the, the the singer in the group grew, I became the the favorite of the group. I was the one that everybody wanted to hear, and they tell me that I was a good looking kid. So, you know, the the girls liked me pretty well, right. <laughs> and, and so eventually, Dick knew. That he had a uh, he had a diamond in the rough. I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can sure. show you here. So I told Dick, I said, you know, I, I I need to make a little more money because don't don't you think we're equal here? So he he him hard around and he said, well, you know, let's face it, you're the draw. And so I became I I became co leader of the band, and so. We played all over the Gulf Coast, all along the Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, uh, Gulf Coast. And we were extremely, extremely popular. Right. And then what happened is really what changed my life. I was going with a girl. You want me to keep going about this? Yes, absolutely. Because this is going to segue into your first song. Okay. So I... uh, I was going with my first love, and she and I always having arguments. I ended up writing a song. I can't, I can't believe it to this day. I wrote a song about her. Right. And it took like 20 minutes to write it. Well, somebody, <clears throat> a, a girl that had dated uh, Dick Holler, the leader of the Rockets, she came to him and she said, Dick, right down the road, 90 miles from where we live in Baton Rouge, there's a studio in New Orleans. And for $25, they'll give you an hour of recording time. Why don't y'all go down there to hear what you sound like? And said, Dick, Dick thought, Hey, that'd be a great idea. Now I was still not the main singer, but I did sing. So we go down there with the band and Dick is the one that's doing the songs. And he's singing a couple of his original songs. And all of a sudden he said, okay, that's it. The studio engineer said, well, look, you paid for an hour. You you still got six minutes. You don't Mm -hmm. have anything else. Dick Holler said, no, I don't have anything. And he looked over at me, said, Jimmy, do you have anything? And I remember it. To this day, I can't remember how I I remember this, but I remember the song. Mm -hmm. Well, the song that I've written in 20 minutes, I went into the studio and after we went through it, I'll never forget the saxophone player who played on all the big hits down there. He looked over at me and he said, that is a hit. And, and that it, song was just a dream. That is correct. And we're going to play a little bit. There's you in the album cover. Anthony, give us a little bit of that video of Jimmy's first big hit. <laughs> Jimmy Clanton. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I, this is not a normal question, but I got to ask you. How tall are you? How tall am I? Yes, because you tower over everybody <laughs> on that stage. Well, at that time, I was 5'11 and a half. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's, that's pretty tall. <laughs> I've never had that question. Good for you, Gene. Oh, you're going to get questions. Uh, <laughs> never, you never had so now you, you're, you're a, now you're a star. Now you're, you're not a local hit anymore. You're, you're national. And we got a picture of you and some of the best people in the business. So how did it feel when you wound up on bandstand and you were hanging out next picture, Anthony, you were hanging out with guys like Dion, who was uh, the, the epitome of uh, East coast doo-wop. Anthony, picture number three, please. You there? Right? So there's you yeah. and there's Dion. Uh there's Dick. Now who is who's who else is in this picture? 
Can you That's, see? Uh, Chris Montez. Chris Montez, yep. And in the back of Dick is Gene Pitney. Gene Pitney. I don't know the guy right there to the right. And then the uh, all the way to the farthest right, as I'm looking, was Brian Hyland. Right. Is that Fabian maybe in the back? No, no. No, okay. No. So you're hobnobbing with, with major stars now. Now you're a major star. Well, Just a Dream so hit the national scale, uh, national stage. And I'm just... You know, they <laughs> come to find out, I I was told by that time that, you know what? The girls are going to like this guy. This is a good looking kid. And I went to high school. We were all good looking guys. So nobody stuck out from anybody. But I I couldn't get out of the dressing room. I couldn't get out. I was I would get mugged. I would get mobbed. And so I don't know who started uh, Teen Idol with me. It may have been Dick Clark. Probably the, the my who became my close friend was, was Alan Freed. Ah, uh, great man. Yeah. But I got that teen idol thing, and Just a Dream was such a huge, huge hit uh, right. you know, worldwide. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so now this is now sixty one. Uh, you wrote Just a Dream. Um, the next one was uh, Go Jimmy Go. Yeah. Did you? Uh, that was written by Howard Greenfield. Uh, but I heard you had a uh, a little part in the hook there, right? Well, what had happened is I had gone into the to the studio to record Go Jimmy Go. I liked it. It was up tempo. And so I went ahead and finished it. We had the backup singers and I'm getting ready to walk out of the studio and the lead singer, the, the girl with the group, and with a very odd look on her face, she walked over to me. She said, Jimmy, I really apologize for asking you this, but are you sure you never recorded this as Go Bobby Go? And I looked at her like she was crazy. I said, well, my name is Jimmy. Of course right. not. Well, out of the clear blue, Go Jimmy Go became a top 10 hit for me. It went to, it went to the top ten faster than Just a Dream even did. Right. So wow. I'm doing a show, and I get a tap on my shoulder several months later, and I look around, and this this kid who's a little shorter than me he looks up at me. He says, "You son of a gun! You stole my song." Well, wow. it was Bobby Rydell. And I said, wow. "Stole your song?" I said, "You got to be kidding!" I said, "That's your tough luck, man. You you could you had the chance to have it, you didn't." So I ran with it, but it was actually. Bobby Wright Dale, who recorded it, but the company decided not to. And so I, I, I recorded it. It became a big hit for me. Right. Wow. That's, that's, that's something. Oh, Johnny Go, the movie, uh, was loosely based on you uh, and your song. Now you're, now you're a T, te- now you're a movie star. I mean, you know, this this is this is Elvis ish. Elvis <laughs> has hit records, goes to the movies. You followed Elvis in, in that way. So when you had to go to Hollywood and do your movie, uh, was it a stretch for you? Well, it's ironic because I had become very close friends with Alan Freed, probably by uh, 1958, 59, and 60 in that time zone there. I really was probably his favorite single white male singer. I mean, I I was on every show he ever did. I was on his, I'd come in and spend three hours on his radio show with him. Right. And so we had done a big show. I, I don't know, the Brooklyn Paramount and one of those theaters that he, uh, he did big shows at. Right. And I was in New York. I, I forget what studio. And it was backstage. And out of the clear blue, he walks by me and very nonchalant. He said, by the way, I'm getting ready to head out to Hollywood within the, the, another week. And he said, I'm f- filming a movie. He gave me an idea about it. He said, the title is Johnny Melody. He said, I'd like for you to play Johnny. And I went, whoa. Now, here's the thing. I had the script for Johnny Melody. That's what it says on the front. Yeah. The script is now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Mm. But by the time we got to Hollywood... Chuck Berry had such a monster hit 
with with uh, Johnny B. Good, and the and the the that wording in there, go Johnny go. So Alan Freed wanted to grab onto the success of, of Chuck Berry's song, so we changed it from Johnny Melody to Go Johnny Go, and that was the theme song when when the movie would come on. That was the song Johnny Be Good, Go Johnny Go that 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 played. Right, but I, I, uh, play I, guess, I, I was so young and. Uh, I thought, oh, okay, we're going to make a movie. You know, I'll have some speaking lines. Okay, no problem. I I didn't have any any hiccups about it. You know, right? Uh, give me the script. Okay, I I got this. We we, we got this. Wow. That's we're gonna how- play. We're gonna play some of uh, Go Jimmy Go, Anthony. <laughs> I told her when it comes to talking, I'm the sweetest sweet talker in the world. She said, you better stop talking if you want me to be your girl. And as she said, go Jimmy, go. Go Jimmy, go. Well, I talked her off that door when she said, go Jimmy, go. Great. Great. I, I got to tell you, you are probably one of the sharpest dressed performers. <laughs> I, I, I really, you know, you're just, you're just a class act all the way. I mean, I got it. Uh, I, I got it. I give, I got to give props to Sandy, my best friend forever. I, when I, uh, when I, when I came and I started doing shows back in 2011, I had two jackets and I would just go from one to another on all the shows. <laughs> and they were both, uh, uh, Tux jackets. They had no pizzazz. And Sandy said, we, we got to change up things here. So I ended up going to New York and I go down to one of these hip hop places down in the Bronx. Where I'm from. Okay. <laughs> and I came across this silver, shiny suit and I showed it to Sandy. I said, what do you think? So I ended up bringing it. I bought it. The next thing I know, she's ordering me suits, Italian made suits with all that pizzazz from all over the nation. And it got to where people would get on Facebook and say, we got to make sure that this show that Jimmy's going to be on, we want to know that he's wearing something new because we can't wait to see what he's got on this time. So people, they wanted to see what new outfit I got that Sandy had for me. So my wardrobe absolutely was killer. Oh, it definitely is. (laughs) It definitely is. Now, the funny part, Jimmy, is that uh, you've had – uh, great success with a number of songs, but the one song that didn't chart the highest is considered your theme song, Venus in Blue Jeans. Uh, that that's considered uh, Jimmy Clanton's uh, Coupe de Gras, and that didn't chart as high as uh, Go Jimmy Go or Just a Dream. But well, people seem people yeah. seem to resonate with that song. I, I don't know what to say about that, but, you know, think about this. Uh, Just a Dream is 1958. Right. Venus in Blue Jeans was four years later. Mm. So if you've got a fan that's 13 with Just a Dream, four years later, she's 17. There's a big difference with fan fan base and what fans love. So everywhere right. I would go, I would have a fan base that would go crazy over Just a Dream. And then... I would do Venus and Blue Jeans and it would be a whole separate bunch and they'll go crazy because I truly had two separate fan bases from those two songs. Wow. Most of them, a lot of them knew Jimmy from Venus and Blue Jeans. That was their Jimmy Clanton song. And then there were, there were those with Just a Dream. So I can't explain it, you know, but that's what happened. Yeah. Well, the, the stars were in alignment with for you with that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got to play the live versions because if we play the studio versions, we get picked up for copyright. But uh, everybody knows what this song is as soon as the strings come in. Anthony, right. Anthony, True. please. Venus in blue jeans. <laughs> She's a walking, talking work of art. 
She's the girl who stole my heart. Wonderful. Uh, you know, it's just, it's got a way about it, that song. You know, that, that song, uh, it, it's kind of strange. The way I found that song, I was up in the record. I was up in the uh, uh, Brill Building, sixteen fifty Broadway. Yeah, I was in the publishing uh, office of uh, Alden Music, and they played me a whole bunch of songs because I was getting ready to do a session. I didn't like anything, and then all of a sudden there was this little cardboard box. I could see it like it just happened. There was a little cardboard box about uh, five feet. I mean, uh, five by by four. And there were a lot of little records in there, what they call demos. Mm. And so I asked, I asked Howard Greenfield, I said, Howie, I said, what's, what's in that box there? And he said, well, he said, those are songs that everybody's heard. He said, everybody turned them down. You, you, you don't want to hear them. I said, well, let me just check them out. Well, I was an excellent guitar player. And because I was such a good guitar player, chord progressions made up songs for me. And and that's how I wrote. I wrote by chord progressions that have these melodic, beautiful melodies. Mm. And so he puts on this, and I can call off the chords. He goes on, he goes, D, F sharp minor, da, da, G, A7, back to D. I went, oh, my God, that's one of my favorite chord changes in the world. I love that song. I want to do it. He said, are you kidding? I said, no, I want to do that. What is it? He said, it's called Venus and Blue Jeans. So that's how I ended up recording that song. I, I just fell in love with those chord progressions. And as you know, it was a huge hit for me na- nationwide. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, now you wind up, now you, you got hits under your belt. Somebody mentioned a great song called Another Sleepless Night. <laughs> one of our, one of our, uh, our viewers, Ethel Jones. Uh, yeah. We're so glad. When, we're so glad when people comment. Yeah. Uh, another sleepless side. We're gonna have to look into that. Uh, that so now, a, what that Jimmy? That was written for me by Neil Sedaka. Really? Yeah. A Neil Sedaka composition. Yeah. That, that's that. Well, I got to get my hands on that because everything Neil writes for himself or for others. Another uh, sleepless night. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and everything's on your website under jimmyclanton.com. So if anybody wants the original recordings, go to jimmyclanton.com and go to his store. Um, he knows you as Sissy. Okay, Sissy. Sissy said hi. <laughs> Sissy said hi. Oh, yeah. Hi, Sissy. And now you wind up in a second movie, A Teenage Millionaire. Yeah. Uh, look at this. So um, who's the young lady with you there? Uh, wow. Uh, who, who is that? Joanne? Is that Joanne Campbell? No, no right? Joanne was born here. Yeah. I'm I'm looking for the name myself on, on the list yeah. there. Golly, I can't uh, see either. Daughter. I, I can't I can't make it out. Right. Uh. So now you you got movies, you got songs, and then in the middle of it, just like Elvis Presley. You get drafted. Yep. And as Elvis would have said, I got drafted and shafted. <laughs> so you go, you do two years in the service. Uh, did you perform? Were you a performer in the service or did you do your duty? Well, as in no time at all, my uh, my company officers, they all found out who I was. So they all made me a very lucrative deal. <laughs> Do a few songs at one of our big dances, and we'll give you a three-day pass. Ooh. So I did that, and they they loved it so much, they came to me the second time. And they said, we'd like to do this again. I said, well, talk to me. They said, well, we'll give you a three-day pass. I said, well, how about two three-day passes back-to-back? So they did. So I flew to Canada and did a big money job and flew back. (laughs) Where were you stationed? Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Form of Missouri, yeah, and and uh, so, so you were able to coincide a big money a, a, a schedule job with a six day pass. Yeah, yeah, which was probably not lawful at the time, but nobody found out. Nobody found <laughs> out. Nobody found out. No. Uh, now you get out in what sixty two? Yeah, sixty two, yeah. and you immediately go back to 
work? Well, what had happened as soon as I go back to work is because when I came out, I called the record company. I said, do we have anything in the can that we've never released? I said, maybe, you know, at least let everybody know I'm back in business, so to speak. And and Johnny Vincent from Ace Records said, well, we got this one song that was kind of like a throwaway. And he said, that's it. I said, well, let's put it out because, you know, if anything is better than nothing. Well, lo and behold, the song that he put out was Venus and Blue Jeans. Right. And so, bam, I'm back on top within 90 days. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now, uh, were you doing the big tour gigs? You were doing the big tour gigs, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. All over yeah. America. Sure. Yeah, all all yeah. over America. Yeah. We see some, uh, you know, thanks to the magic of Facebook, we see all these pictures. Correct. Uh, you were on a show at the Brooklyn Paramount. I think there were 20 acts, and every one of them was a legend before they even really got started. Yeah, it, it was, was like, great. Yeah. Well, see, Alan Freed, what he had done when he was still in Cleveland as a DJ, he came up with the idea of. I'm going to find out where these artists are with the, all these great songs that everybody listens to. And I want to put on a, a show. I'm going to bring them into Cleveland. Well, nobody thought that was a good idea. They thought you're going to fall flat on your face. It's not going to work out. But he brought in the acts and it was all of them were sell. They sold out. Well, New York saw what he was doing in Cleveland and WABC uh, they just they made him a deal he couldn't turn down. So they brought him and he went to New York and just duplicated what he had done in Cleveland. And so he would go to those music uh, to those uh, movie theaters. Right. And he would make a deal with him. He say, look, let your movie run. But then in between the movies, let me put on my live show. And we would do five shows a day. Unbelievable. And so it was it was Alan Freed. He would bring in the artist. And we would do those big shows. A genius. But, yeah. A genius. And everybody became big stars. Yeah. Zazu Pitts <laughs> was the name of the girl in the picture. No, 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 no. That was uh, Diane Jurgens is a young girl. Okay. Diane okay. Jurgens. There you That's go. Her name. We Diane, had somebody. Diane Jurgens. J E R T E N. Yeah. Right. We had uh, D Fitzgerald said Zazu Pitts. So D, you're wrong. Okay. Well, she was in the movie. She was in the movie, but she's yeah. not on a poster, yeah. But that's not the poster there. Right. So now, I, I, you got so much to talk about, so I'm a little bit Russian. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, you're on these big uh, bus tours, and you wind up you wind up in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Uh, and you got to go on and the date is November 22nd, 1963. Yeah. So you were in the epicenter when we untimely lost President Kennedy. Well, what had happened there is I found out that we had a day off because we, wherever we were, the top of the United States somewhere, we had a day off so that we could have the time to get to Dallas. Mm. So what I did was I decided to take a day off and I flew home. Because I I lived in Houston, Texas at the time. And so I could, you know, I could, uh, it was a hop, skip and jump to get to Dallas. And I'll never forget, I got a phone call the morning of the supposed show. Mm. And it was Dick Clark's uh, side, uh, honcho, whoever, you know, road manager. He said, Jimmy, do not bother coming to Dallas. And he explained to me what happened. Mm. But, you know, the same type of scenario happened, I think, with April of, uh, was it 59 with, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Peggy Sue and Buddy Holly. But February. Oh, the day the music died. Yeah. February. Okay. Yeah. In, in April, it was it 59? February. February 59. I was on a big two, big show, big tour. And there was a knock at the door and the manager of the tour looked at me very solemnly. And he said, I know there's two more weeks to go on this tour. He said, but would you consider leaving this tour and picking up another tour up in Iowa? I said, why? 
And he said, because Buddy Holly, the big bopper, and Richie Valens have died in a plane crash, and the promoter insists that the show goes on, and he insists that we fill the the the, uh, the rest of his tour with with big stars. Wow! And I was shocked because I knew those guys. I'd done shows. I knew everybody in the business by then. Right. So I'll never forget. I, I grabbed a plane. They put me on a plane. I flew up. I picked up the tour. And I remember like I'm sitting right here. I got up on that Greyhound bus and I looked down that long aisle of that bus. And at the very, very back, hanging up, were the different uh, pieces of clothing and, and, mm. and things uh, of, of the guys, you know, all of them. Mm. And I, I wondered to myself, how in the world am I supposed to do you know, a show on stage. <clears throat> so I ended up, because <clears throat> I'm such a good guitar player, I ended up taking Buddy's guitar and just did a tribute to him. I did Just a Dream and, uh, and, and took a bow and walked off. That was about it, you know. It was wow. very somber. But, but that was a moment for me to remember, obviously. Right. right. I see there's a poster behind you, and it looks like it says the crickets. Uh to your right, over your right shoulder. Rockets. Uh, I can't see the whole poster. Oh, that, that was my original band, The Rockets. Oh, The Rockets. I yeah. only see. The, I'm sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, so now you, you're doing your dates. Did you ever have a real job? No. <laughs> the, only job had I, the only job I did was uh, do gigs. <laughs> right. Right. And now in 1964, when the British invasion knocked. American popular music out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you, you still continue to write before? Well, I, you know, I was uh, myself and uh, the, the guys that I hung out with on tours, Jimmy Beaumont from the Skyliners. Uh, he and I were very, very close. And what happened with all of us is, and this is exactly exact truth. We never had the slightest hint that our merry-go-round would ever stop. To us, we're going to do this till we leave this earth, and we're just going to rock and roll, do our song, do our hits, and just tour, tour, take a week off, tour. We thought it was going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. All of us did. Right. But when that British invasion hit overnight, you couldn't even get a record played if you didn't have a British accent. Wow. And... No gigs. I had no talents except singing. So kind of in desperation, I found out that in that particular time frame, uh, hotels uh, had nightclubs and they would have live bands. Mm. So I put together a road show <clears throat> and I toured a lot of the hotels and the clubs all over America. I did that for uh, several, several years until... August of 1980, right? When everything changed right. again, we're gonna we're gonna get to that. I got two more major points I need to bring up. Okay, uh, I don't know if you did any due diligence on me, but I am an Elvis aficionado all my life, and I there was all that. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I'm a performer for 40 years. I started when I was 14, uh, and there is a wonderful picture of you. Elvis Presley and Rocky yeah. Graziano. Yeah. So w was this taken on the set of Kid Galahad? This was on the set of uh, Blue Hawaii. Blue Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. So uh, elaborate, please. Well, what had, ha <clears throat> what had happened, I had been in Memphis <clears throat> about six months prior to this and had done a big show in Memphis. And I, out of the clear blue, I asked somebody backstage, I said, this is crazy. Is Elvis in town? Is there any way in the world to, to meet him? <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, well, we're going to find out. So a friend of a friend of a friend, <laughs> lo and behold, got a hold of Elvis at Graceland. Come on. Yeah. And said to him, you know, they got this show in town, Jimmy Clanton and they're really asking, is there any way that, 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 you, that you could just meet them and just say hello? He said, yeah, they can come on over. So lo and behold, 
Got in the car. I'll never forget this, obviously. We go to Graceland. <laughs> Have you ever met Elvis, Gene? No. Nope. Okay. Because nope. I see you're about to uh, fall over here. Yeah, it is. And so I'm the first one out of the car. I, and this is, I, honest to God, I'll never forget this. This is exactly what happened. I run up to the top and I knock <laughs> on the door of Graceland. The door opens. Oh, my God. And looking down at me with a yacht hat on is Elvis himself. He looks down at me and he says, well, Jimmy, if I'd known you were coming, I'd have had just a dream on the record player. Well, I'd only recorded about three songs at that time, you know, that he would mention my record, you know. Right, right. So he showed us his house and everything. I've got a lot of stories about him, even my in my uh, own autobiography I'm going to be telling. But uh, so I got to meet him there. And I'll never forget when you walk in to the left is like this big seating area, kind of an open area. And when I looked in there up on the wall, as close as you could get, and this was a huge room. This is this by 30 by 25, you know, mm. and around and around and went and as close as you could get it were gold records of his singles all around. And then I looked down and there was this big coffee table. You know how you would take a, say about eight <clears throat> magazines yeah. and casually just go to the table and just kind of let them just fall and they just kind of scatter. Okay. We're gold records. Just the hanging out. Room up on the wall. <clears throat> True story. You know, I went to Graceland with yeah. Joey D. Uh, Joey's like family to me. And when we walked into Elvis's Hall of Records, Joey tugs on my shirt and he said, I got one. And I thought I was great. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, it's, everybody's great in their own way, of course. Uh, but another point I have to bring out uh, today and for the past 50, 60 years, uh, not, not 60, the past 50 years, oldies shows and revival shows are the norm. But you uh, have the distinction of being in the first revival show. Yeah. Promoted by Richard Nader. Correct. We have the program right here. Yeah. We I have the program. That. And that was the the, the 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 test tube. If that didn't go well. Correct. It, it could have been a one-time deal. So for I, those of you listening to us, that listen to this lineup. Put that away. I want to see Jimmy's face if he remembers this. Uh, the funny men of doo the Coasters, with Carl Gardner. Right. The Shirelles, the ultimate girl group, the Shirelles. Yeah. The father of rock and roll, Bill Haley and the Comets. Right. The quintessential romantic group, the Platters. Right. With Tony Williams. And then the architect of rock and roll, Chuck Berry. Right. Then thrown in the mix... <laughs> For some reason, was Sha Na Na. Who? Sha Na Na. Oh, Sha Na Na. Okay. Now that's because they were at Woodstock and they had the TV show. Right. And then in the middle of these, and Jimmy, don't take this uh, the wrong way. You said you had three big so far. These groups had dozens. They picked you to represent the teen idol. Of that show, uh, you know they they could have went with household names and, but you you held your own next to these legends and create. I heard you created an uproar that day when you walked out. <laughs> Richard Nader told me that he heard one of the biggest roars when you walked out that day. I mean that must have been. Just an or ex or experience for you. Well, I had remembered I was up in the booking agency. I was walking just down the hallway, and Richard Nader happened to come out of a, a side door, and he stopped me. He said, "I'm getting ready to do something." He said, "I'm just laying it all out on the line." He said, "There's no way that our music is finished, Jimmy." And he said, "I I want to take a chance." And I'm just believing it's going to happen. So he told me all the story about what he wanted to do, 
with the groups at, at Madison Square Garden. And he said, would you come on the show? I said, oh, my God, Rich. I said, I'd be happy to. And it was a sellout. Sellout. And it just opened the door for our era to right. resurface greater than ever. ever. Right. Yeah. Now, now, at that point, uh, that was 22,000 people. Yeah. You yeah. know, people people think it was in the Felt Forum, which was 7,000 people. No, that's correct. Because that's, that's where it wound up later years. That's but true. But you were in the main. Was that the biggest crowd you had played to? Uh, no, because when I was in Italy last year, we had 40,000 one Saturday. 40,000. 40,000 one Saturday night. Yeah. Was that, was Who was on that show? Was well, that there were, it was in Italy. A, a lot of the artists that are from Europe and okay. a lot of that era. And somehow or another, uh, they asked me to, to be there. And uh, yeah, so I was there. How does it feel to walk out and... and- See 40,000 people. You know, I don't know how to put this, but it's amazing that for me, whether it's 25, 2,500, 35, 40,000, I just get up there and just give them what I have. Hope they enjoy it. I, I've never, I've never been quote unquote, I never had stage fright, so to speak. That's well, just, you're- Never happened. You're a consummate. You're a consummate professional, and you've yeah. also shared the stage with some great acts like Ronnie Dove and Ray Peterson, Troy Shondell, and then and then you wound up on a stage with with Ray Charles. You did the Jazz Fest with Ray Charles. I mean, these are iconic people uh, that you wouldn't normally know to mix with. That is correct. Uh, uh, I just had the opportunity to be available. For different shows with artists that were the, the consummate uh, one of a kind, you know, Ray Charles. And, but I met people I never did shows with that I've never forgotten. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, Alan Freed picked me up one night. He said, <clears throat> I was in New York. We didn't have a show. He said, I'm going to come pick you up tonight about 10 o'clock. Can you be ready? I was in New York City. I said, well, sure. So he picks me up in a cab and we go around and we come around. We walk up these stairs and walk into this gorgeous uh, venue that I never heard of. I said, what, what, what place is this? He said, well, Jimmy, this is called the Copacabana. I said, oh, is this a famous nightclub? He said, very famous. Oh, said, my God. Yeah. <clears throat> so we walk in. The place is just about closed. And we're just uh, like with our elbow up on the bar. No, nobody's there. And I'm looking over at Alan. And he said, Jimmy, you told me there's somebody famous that you would have always loved to meet. And it just so happens that person, Jimmy, is a personal friend of mine. I want you to turn around and meet him yourself. I turned around and looked up and it was Nat King Cole. Wow. Oh, my living Lord have mercy. Wow. The the man was huge. Big smile. Grabbed my hand, shook hands with me. I, but that was the kind of man Alan Freed was. So I got to meet Nat King Cole and shake hands with him. Oh my God! At the Copacabana. At the Copacabana. Uh, yeah. Alan Freed. Alan Freed, for whatever uh, faults might have been, got railroaded, and and still does not get the proper respect uh, he should. Uh, but that's well, another story. I'm I'm going to say. First hand, Alan Freed never, ever asked for one penny under the table from me or through me for the record company, ever. Mm. But I know some people that had to take money before I could get appearances on their show, and right. I'll leave it at that. Right, okay. Well, Not yeah. Alan, never. Right. Well, never. I hope that's going to be in your book. Uh, stories like that because they deserve yeah. to be told. It now, um, your book is, you're working on your book and the title is absolutely what it should be, Just a Dream, the Jimmy Clanton story. And we're going to keep a close eye on that. We want everybody to go to your website once again. But you you are really a two-sided coin. And in, 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 uh, in August of 1980, 
when I was graduating, when I was going into high school, you had, uh, for lack of a better word, an epiphany. Correct. I don't know if there's a better word. Uh, I don't think there is. And you turned uh, down another path towards the Lord. And um, this is a show in itself, an hour show in itself. But can you give us uh, the Reader's Digest version of what happened to you that you can attest why you went down that road? When I was a very, very young boy, uh, this particular uh, religious denomination had some rules and regulations. Uh, They were not in the Bible, but they were just things that they said were part of their setup. And uh, I, I, I did something out of order. It's kind of weird. Wasn't a big thing. I was only about six years old, for heaven's sake. <clears throat> but come to find out, it was a huge sin in this denomination. And it could cost me my life. I, 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 I'm Just bear with me, folks. <clears throat> so I, I, I ran home to my mom and everybody said, well, don't worry about it. You, you're just a kid. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Well, I didn't. And for 30 some odd years, I just stuffed it. But by the time I was in my early 40s, I started having thoughts about afterlife. And I realized because of what I had done in this uh, denomination, it was considered such a a horrendous sin that I could die and and go into whatever darkness was for a young boy. And I I started looking for books that, that would help me, and I couldn't find anything to help me. And so in August of 1980, uh, things were not going going well with my road show. I was very despondent. And I came home and I came in one night. It was about 11 o'clock. And there was only one network on, on this TV because I was in the woods and I, I didn't have an antenna. And this man starts talking about Jesus Christ and starts talking about what Jesus Christ did on the cross and began to expound on every level of who Jesus was, what he came to earth to do. And I never heard anybody tell this. I had believed in Jesus, but I believe he was up there with a big sledgehammer ready to crush me for the rules and regulations that I hadn't been doing right. And so at the very end of this, this uh, probably about midnight, he said this. He said, Jesus will forgive you. You just ask him, tell him you repent of the sins. Ask him to be your savior and he will save you and, and ask him to be your Lord. And he, he has forgiven you. You'll be his child. I never heard anybody ever say that, but I was, I was dubious, but I looked up at the ceiling and I, I was so down because things was going so bad with my career. And so I looked up and I just said out loud, I said, well, if what this man says is true, then God, I, I just ask you to forgive me that sin and, Come into my heart and what's the, and he said, what's the rest of it? Oh, <laughs> come into my heart, forgive me, and, and be my savior. And immediately, physically, I began to feel this incredible rush of tremendous heat. It began to just pulsate in my gut. I mean, it was uncontrollable. I went from 98.6 regular. It was like 110, 112 degrees, just pulsating. And at the same time, I felt this little like a little a bubble uh, <clears throat> on a string physically being pulled up my leg. It came up, it came up, it came up. And when it got to my chest, it got up into my throat. My tongue was taken over and the little ball bearing on the string got on my tongue and it and exploded and it was just air. And it was air on the tongue that forms words. And when that happened to me, it wasn't me that did it. And out of my mouth, in those words, here's what I heard. Not only do I ask you to come into my heart and save me to be, but be Lord of my life. And immediately I was like helium. It was like all of the crud and all of the junk of everything that had just permeated my being just came off of me. I don't remember going to bed, but I'll sum it up with this. I went to bed and the next morning I remember opening my eye. I see it like it just happened a minute ago because you don't forget things like this. Mm. I opened my eyes and I had a thought. The thought was, my God, did that happen last night? Yes. And immediately I jumped back. And I, out of my mouth, I said, 
Is that you, God? Yes. And my friend, he began to speak to me. He he spoke to me audibly. He spoke to me so loudly. I could go on and on and on. And so what happened was I was so immersed in this glorious love of this God of this universe who was taking over my life that for the next 14 years, between 1980 and 1995, I couldn't tell you anything about the radio uh, songs, about Top 40. I couldn't tell you anything because I went all over the nation giving testimony of this incredible God of love that had come down, taken me over, and began speaking to me every day and bringing me, as the Bible says, joy unspeakable and gloriously done forever. Wow. Uh, wow. And the, and the pastor the, and the pastor that got you to that point was John Osteen, uh, Joel Osteen's father. Well, I was up here in Pennsylvania and, and I, I had an engagement <coughs> down in Texas and, and God sent some people to where I was playing and said, God told us you're to come to church with us. So I went to church with them and it was John Osteen's church. And uh, in fact, uh, somebody said, they, they want to introduce me. And somebody told him about me, about this famous singer who's now a, a, a Christian. And <clears throat> and so he came down the aisle <clears throat> and he spoke to me. He said, can you come back tonight and do a song? I said, well, uh, uh, OK. So I, I came back that night. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I came back that night and I did a song that I'd written, kind of an up-tempo, born again. And when I walked away, I don't know if I can get through this, but as I walked away, John Osteen, it got real quiet. There's about 3,700 people there. And as I walked away from the stand, he, he looked over at me. He said, Brother Jimmy, he said, I can't put a call to preach on you, but I want to declare to you that you are a minister. I didn't know what that meant at the time. Years later, God told me that word minister there meant you're a servant. Mm. He said, mm. You're called a minister and you're called to herald the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gifts of God will be mightily poured through you. And there will be a flow of the supernatural that will bless people abundantly wherever you go. So do not worry, my son, for you're a special servant and you will enter into that which you have been called from the foundation of the world. So obey me. And from that moment, that word from Almighty God upon my life began to yeah, come to pass year after year after year. And then in 1994, this prophetess came over and said, God's getting ready to take you back 180 degrees back in the music behind the scenes because he has nobody to represent him and he wants you to represent him there. God opened up the door for me to come back into to the music. And within two weeks of that prophet, I get a call from Richard Nader. He said, I've been looking for you for 17 years. I had an unlisted phone number. How in God's name could he find me? Mm. He said, and I said, I don't play bars. He said, no, no. They'd sit down concerts. And I thought, I called John Osteen. I said, what do you think about this? Because I was happy preaching, praying, prophesying all over America. Mm. He said, Brother Jimmy, that's God. He said, for you will be able to minister to people that wouldn't even cross the threshold of a church. That's right. God. I accepted right. the engagement. And from that engagement to this day, everywhere I go, God always has at least one specifically for me to speak to. Jimmy, I don't normally do this. I have to ask you to please come back on my show again, and we will talk strictly about your revelations and your ministry. Uh, you are, you need two books, Jimmy. You need one pre-1980 and post-1980. You are a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of career. But what you just said in the past five minutes is almost as equally important, if not more, than what you did from 58 through on. I mean, to reach people through one medium is is fabulous. To For two mediums, that's a calling. And I would be so honored if you allow me to do another interview with you based solely on your secular life. Well, I can promise you this. Okay. Years ago, 
God told me this. He said, I will open the doors I want you to go through. And he said, there'll be and the doors I don't want you to go through. I will close them. So I have always honored that. But I can tell you, my friend, God is speaking right now. And he wants you to do this with me. And he is going to bring forth the miraculous through your program, through the things that I will, I will be praying. I will be prepared. And I tell you, when I come on the word of almighty God will be fresh. It'll be fresh manna from heaven and people will be changed for the better in Jesus name. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is Uh, God. And I will be more than happy to do that. Wonderful. Uh, I have to ask my viewers, Jimmy Clanton was inducted into the Gulf Coast Hall of Fame. He was inducted into the Louisiana Hall of Fame. But he's not in what they consider the (laughs) real one, Uh, this, this Hall of Fame in Cleveland. I need my viewers. I need my fans. I need my 5,000 Facebook friends to send emails, to send letters to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame demanding an explanation why this man, who now has two different careers, who is celebrating not only hit records, but hit sermons. Why is this man not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? That is your job, my friends, over the next couple of weeks. Let's bombard this Hall of Fame with why we want a reasonable explanation why this man is not immortalized forever in that building. Um, We're going to get on another show, but you wrote a song which we're going to end our show. Jimmy, (laughs) I am so happy that we facilitated this and thanks to Sandy and thanks to sis, everybody that got me in touch with you, never thinking you would have said yes. You have been a fabulous, fabulous guest. You're also a songwriter of gospel and you wrote a song called pardon me. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. I think uh, next week is Christmas. Uh, However, people want to celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, we're going to go out with that song. Okay. And everything is available on your website, jimmyclanton.com. Uh, he's got, how many Facebook pages do you have? Like 28 pages or something? <laughs> 28 pages? Please join his fan page. Let him know you saw him on Gene DiNapoli's podcast. Mr. Clanton, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. I wish you, your friends, your family a blessed holiday season. I'll get back to you in a few days, and we're going to go out with your original song. you have anything to add? God bless you, Gene, and uh, God bless the viewers. Uh, I want you to know that this, my being here with you tonight was ordained before the world was formed. And I will be glad to preach on that later down the road. Everything that I am doing for the things of God since that night in August of 1980, God ordained it that it would happen exactly as it's happening. And my being with you tonight is exactly something that God ordained. And you have been blessed. And God's going to bless you because you're taking this to the next level. And that pleases him. When you please the Lord. He will bless you abundantly. I've been blessed with healthy family, healthy life, uh, good old friends from years ago, and now good new friends, which I'd like to consider you. So ladies and gentlemen, as we do every week, please let's give our guest, Mr. Jimmy Clanton, or the Reverend Jimmy Clanton, (laughs) the biggest round of applause we can. Thank you, Jimmy. God bless you. Thank you, Gene. And we go out on Pardon Me, Do You Know Jesus? All right. (laughs) Pardon me, but do you know Jesus? Pardon me, do you know the Lord? Uh, Unbelievable. Everybody, thank you. This was such a wonderful show. All our shows have been wonderful. But to get somebody that I didn't personally know 
uh, to agree with this. So, so happy. Uh, we continue next week with a very, another very special guest who this guy's another teen idol, probably one of the biggest songs in the universe. Uh, when they, when they go to Mars, this song will be on Mars as Americana rock and roll. Uh, next week's guest, Anthony, put it up. Brian Hyland. It was an itsy bitsy teeny. Come on, everybody sing along. Brian Hyland next Monday, December 21st, seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Share our page, share our Facebook, share our YouTube. The more we get, the better we're going to get. Please, once again, let's uh, do our sponsors. Let's kick in our sponsors. Dream Destination, SundrenchCruises.com, all your travel needs. SweetHeel.com, CBD products. There you go. Mention our podcast, 20% off your order. After that, we're going to the Creative CPA, Francisco, TransFrancisco.com. Then we're going to hit you with a dry cleaner on Tremont Avenue, also known as Mr. Positive. Pure organic, pay for three items, get your fourth one free. After that, send a gift basket to those you love, being that you can't be with them in person. Call Anthony's Gift Baskets. The number is on our office page on the Gene DiNapoli, reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli page. And last but not least, our friends in Yonkers, San Martino Restaurant. Great old Italian food, wonderful entertainment, and beautiful people. They're 46 years. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give my producer, Anthony Griffo, a round of applause. Keep it going for Mr. Jimmy Clanton. We'll see you next week. Remember, be safe, be positive, stay well. God bless you, and God bless America. This is Gene DiNapoli signing out. See you next week, everybody. Pardon me, but to you know Thank you.